not only uh, do we see cortisol appearing in the bloodstream directly because of what you ate, but also insulin, which is released after your meal, goes to the liver and says, holy crap, we need more cortisol. And they regenerate cortisol from the stuff that the liver was in the process of breaking down, the, the old cortisol that the liver was dismantling. It goes, what, you need this? Oh, okay. And it goes ahead and makes new cortisol again, and that gets dumped into the circulation. So what's the fresh look? Uh, well, the fresh look is to remember that what we are talking about is too much cortisol. So let's start there. Um, is the pituitary gland the only reason that we could crank out a lot of cortisol? As it turns out, the answer is no. Uh, cortisol also gets increased by after every single meal and after uh, and through the insulin, which of course is also really released after every single meal. Here's a picture. So if we, the chart there, basically the graph shows um, kind of what happens with cortisol, how it's just kind of ticking along, maybe even slowly declining there on the left-hand side of the chart. And then somebody has a meal in that gray box area and then suddenly what happens to your cortisol levels? Well, sometimes they keep on going down if you ate a placebo. I don't know how you have a placebo in the way of a meal, but nevertheless, they did it. Uh, if you have carbohydrates, they go up. If you have fat, they go up. If you have protein, you go up. This is a, uh, obviously in people is what this is being measured in. The point is that these meals, um, uh, can induce this variation in plasma cortisol levels, and the adrenal gland responds directly to these meals. Um, and in addition, not only uh, do we see cortisol appearing in the bloodstream directly because of what you ate, but also insulin, which is released after your meal, goes to the liver and says, holy crap, we need more cortisol. And they regenerate cortisol from the stuff that the liver was in the process of breaking down, the, the old cortisol that the liver was dismantling. It goes, what, you need this? Oh, okay. And it goes ahead and makes new cortisol again, and that gets dumped into the circulation. So meals have a big impact on uh, your cortisol levels. And the higher the insulin levels, the higher the impact. The more that you eat, the higher the impact. And so right away we find out that diet and eating has a lot to do with how much cortisol you have swimming around your body. In fact, it creates a bit of a vicious circle because, I mean, those of you who have Cushing's dogs, you know they like to eat a lot, right? Well, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to have huge insulin levels after that. Well, what's that going to do? Dump a bunch of cortisol into their bloodstream. What's that going to do? make them super hungry. And so you have this vicious circle of overeating, high insulin, high cortisol, eat too much, overeating, high insulin, high cortisol, around and around and around we go. And um, if you're eating the wrong kind of food, as we saw in the last chart, uh, something that's too rich uh, for that dog, and of course the exact foods that aggravate different species probably vary, but eating the wrong meal then you're going to have this direct effect on cortisol as well. So at first, I mean, this happens to everybody. It happens to you, it happens to me, uh, but it's temporary. But what if this happened all the time? Uh, your adrenal glands would start to get big. And once they get big enough, they finally test positive according to the ACTH injections. They finally is a big enough secretion of cortisol that your veterinarian has the party in the clinic and gets busy treating your dog with the drug. But up until that time, you get these symptoms, but you don't have yet this dog that's adapted to this constant vicious circle by 
inflating its adrenal glands. They're just a normal size. And if they're a normal size, they don't release enough hormone when they get injected with the test uh, material to show up as positive. But eventually this goes on long enough, big puffy adrenal glands, and finally they crank out enough cortisol that you're that you're able to have the party. Also, insulin has a double whammy here because it will jack up the sensitivity of the body's cells to cortisol. So that means that you could actually have relatively normal cortisol levels, but you'd if you had high insulin levels from overeating, you'd act like you had too much. Because you have relatively too much. You got a, a maybe approximately the right amount, but now there's so many more cells looking for it and trying to respond to it that when they get their hands on it, it's this big dramatic increase in symptoms. Um, so these are the reasons why uh, a lot of these animals test negative, test negative, test negative, and then they're positive. And instead of having a bizarro pituitary tumor, which should be a rare event, and have us saying, well, my goodness, it's supposed to be a very common kind of cancer because everyone's getting it. Well, no, the much more common event is just you eating. So we have a very common event leading to high cortisol levels uh, and an increased response to existing cortisol levels. And that just seems to make much more sense than an epidemic of pituitary tumors sweeping through the canine population. As I said, they're extremely rare in people. Why wouldn't they be rare in dogs? It makes sense that a common event like eating um, would be much more likely to be culpable with so many different cases swimming around the world. So how do you know if your dog has this? Well, a key symptom of having too much insulin is being overweight. If that's your dog, the one that's lying there in the picture, then they have too much insulin, so much that they're probably becoming resistant to it. It's like, you know, it's, it's constantly around, it's constantly on sale, and they just stop responding to it. And so the insulin levels stay high and continue to jack up cortisol levels. If your dog looks like that, then they have too high insulin levels. If they have too high insulin levels, they're going to have really high cortisol levels, and they run the risk of um, appearing like they have uh, Cushing's disease. And eventually they might truly have it once their adrenal glands get big enough. Okay, so fair enough, we get a brand new model. We're going to target cortisol levels, and we're going to just remove from our thinking that they must have some sort of brain tumor. And we're just going to say, what if we just change the diet? What if they just ate differently? Would that actually reverse a lot of these cases? Um, and so that turns out to be exactly what happened. It's such a, such a, a simple solution for the majority of dogs, not all. So we use diet change. That is the single most important thing you can do for your dog is just change what they're eating. How are you going to change it? Change it so they can't overeat. How you can do that? You're going to um, have the food be absorbed more slowly so the insulin levels stay low. You're going to have more water and fiber built into the food so they get full before they get um, uh, before they've eaten too much food. And so if this sounds a lot like the dietary advice that you've been given, yeah, it's the same recommendation for your dog, except they're a carnivore. Um, so maybe a bit more meat uh, in their diet than maybe is healthy for humans. Um, and then what we do is we take, we, the, the diet change lays a foundation for eventually curing the problem. And then we augment it um, using herbal medicine, one formula in particular. Thank you.